are. What a blessed rain we had. I mean, there was mud. Lots of mud. Um, God answers prayers, you know. Uh, it feels good to be back in the routine. You know, how do we know that our routine is God's will for us? You know, I love what I do. I probably, I probably pay to do what I do here. I, I mean, I feel like a tourist here. You know, <laughs> some, some people pay to work on a dude ranch. You know, Jason's wondering who does that, right? <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, some people pay to run a marathon, but, you know, but this is so much more rewarding. Every challenge, every trial, every, every blessing, every victory, every relationship, testimony, movement, and growth, it's so fulfilling. This is not a job. This is an eternal training and investment so, for so much more, and uh, it's so exciting to be a part of God's work, but, you know, whatever you do, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord and not unto men. Uh, let's, let's turn to uh, John 5, verse 30, please. You know, last week we looked at the deity of Christ. Jesus is God. You know, he became one of us. We were created in his image. In his image, we were created. You know, as we look at Jesus' way, his truth, and his life, you know, may we not just be tourists here. Uh, reading the post like, a, like this is some kind of museum. Whoa, praise God. You know, whoa, whoa. May we see the image that Christ saw in us from the beginning. You know, who for the joy set before Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. Not because he had pity on you. Oh, you poor sinner. You know, oh, you're doomed for hell. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shed my blood so that, so that you can come to heaven forever. No, so that we could be restored, so that we can be reconciled, so that we can be regenerated, transformed back to the image that of his original creation, his original intent for us, so that we could be one with God. You know, this church is not a museum studying, proclaiming, or observing the greatness of God. Well, this is a mill. This is, this is, a, this is a pottery shack. This is, this is, this is a winery or, or a tailor shop. God is transforming each and every one of us to his image and building us together as a body of Christ. You know, we're different. I mean, look around. Um, we have different gifts, personalities, and insights, and we need each other. God has placed each one of us in this body for this transforming purpose and process. You know, and, and sometimes it's like iron sharpening iron. <laughs> Serious stuff. But how do we go about navigating in this alien land as ambassadors, of, as citizens of heaven? You know, as many members of one body in Christ. You know, as Jesus was going about his earthly ministry, he was acutely aware of what he needed to do. He knew because his eye was on what the Father was doing. In John 5, verse 30, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. If I testify about myself... My testimony is not valid. There's another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. So I'm going to stop there where we'll read on, and he talks about John. He's talking about John. But, uh, but the, the thing Jesus did was he saw what his father was doing, and he could do nothing of himself. How many of you like to play chess? Or you play chess? <laughs> it's... It's good to be a few moves ahead, right, in your mind? You know, some, some people say, you know, always have three moves ahead. Well, with the Father, He isn't just two or three moves ahead. He has already finished the game, right? The game's already done. 
And as we, his paw, or pawns or whatever, he, his kings or his princes, is he, he says, I want you there. He says, what? But I want you there. He knows. He knows the end from the beginning. And it's important to follow, even if we don't understand it. You know, John the Baptist, you know, he was this crazy ambassador doing God's work, born six months before Jesus and, and preparing the way for the Lord. But his every step was guided by God. And it led him to prison. And it led him to the gates of heaven because he was beheaded. And <laughs> John was at one point in saying he was in prison. He sent his disciples to Jesus. Are you really the one? And Jesus says, yeah. Look at what I'm doing. Look at the miracles. The dead are raised. The, the blind see. The, the lame are walking. And he sent that message back to G John. Just to, for, for John. Hey, I am the one. In verse 33, you have sent... To John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to joy his light. I have a testimony weightier than that of John, for the very work that the Father has given me to finish, and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has testified. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Please keep your places here, and we're going to turn to Romans 8.20. You know, John testified about Jesus. Jesus' works testified about Jesus. The entire word of God, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms testified about Jesus. And we need to see, listen, and confess. And confession is more than lip service. You know, I, when, I was a, when I was a child, I had this reoccurring dream that I was in a coma. And I had these loving and caring family members all around me encourage me, hey, wake up, Peter, wake up, Peter. And, and I, was, I was in this state of mind. I was having a good dream. No. I mean, I didn't have to, I didn't have to eat. I didn't have to breathe. I didn't have to... My heart didn't have to beat for myself. I mean, everything in my little cocoon was just saying, oh, so comfortable here. And I was just hearing the voices, wake up, Peter, wake up, Peter. I'm sitting there going, no, no. I'm warm. I feel comfortable. I'm just sitting here. And I just kept having this dream, and then pretty soon I woke up from this dream that I refused to wake up from, and it was like into a peek into my life. You know, and, and I'm thinking of Aaron Skubel when he was in a coma, and it reminded me of this dream as well, you know, and, and uh, he woke up. You know, life support is temporary. And one day there will be a time when, when all that are in their graves will hear the voice of Jesus. The Son of God. And, I, and, I, and, I, and as I ponder and I reflect this dream, I'm thinking, how many out there are in the process of, of waking up to live? Or, or am I just on a process of death? Just dreaming my life away. You know, worldly speaking, this is an awesome dream. You know, the sights, the smells, the, the wonder. Yeah, there's, there's a little bit of sin. Yeah, there's, there, there's, 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 there's death and, and, and sickness and stuff. But, but really, overlooking it, just, just look at the mountains, this, the, the flowers. This is a beautiful world that we live in. 
And worldly speaking, you know, this is a dream we don't want to wake up from, so to speak. But Jesus is beckoning at the deathbed of this reality to wake up from our slumber. All creation rise like a woman in birth pains. And, and, and one day, one day, it's going to happen. It's set. Babies don't stay in the, in, in, in the womb forever. In the same way, in Romans 8, verse 20, for creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Please, let's, let's turn to John 5, 41. You know, Colton, Eli, and, uh, and um, Elizabeth, Iris Elizabeth, uh, where's, where's Carol? There she is. She had, a, she had a grandchild, too, born this week. Iris Elizabeth. Um, but, but they couldn't stay in the womb. I mean, they, they, they had to get out. You know, they were destined to come out. And, and this world, this creation, this reality is destined to be liberated from its bondage to, de to decay. You know, woohoo, right? It's going to be. We, like the rest of creation, have a hope as the angels long to look at, at this, this redemption thing. You know, and, and I, I just imagine them over, over our, our hospital bed or whatever and saying, is it going to happen? What's going to happen? Can it really happen? Or as, as we're birth, new birth into a new reality of Jesus Christ in us, the testimony and the work that Christ heals us. You know, Jesus relays his proof by the light of his contemporary, John the Baptist. Jesus relays the works that the Father was doing through him. Even to John the Baptist, he says, look, what I, look, look, the dead are raised, the blind see, the lame walk. That was his proof. And then, he is pointing to Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And he says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but it is they that speak of me. Please, look, observe, listen, and then move there and confess Jesus is God. Throughout John, there's a buildup to this full and trusting to Jesus. There's a buildup of John the Baptist declaring Jesus, and then Jesus getting our attention and belief because of his miracles, to being born again and to the work of the cross. There's a buildup of the past scripture that unveiled Jesus as Jesus ministers and fulfills it, all of it. There's a buildup of knowing Jesus through our knowledge of his life in us. You know, I want to know Jesus as I am fully known. I, I want Jesus to entrust his life to me, to my belief system. Not because, oh, I saw Jesus do this work. Oh, I heard John the Baptist. Oh, oh, I, I read about it in scriptures, you know, and, 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 and I understand it. And, and whoa, this is awesome. But I want this life that Jesus purposed in me not to be here, but inside of me. We must strive for the same purpose as, as this with Jesus, even with the very words we speak, the thoughts we process, and, and, and to our very motives. This isn't just what would Jesus do or what would Jesus think, or, but we need to examine our lives if, to see if we are doing what Jesus is doing and thinking what Jesus is thinking and desiring what Jesus is desiring. You know, we can praise Jesus all we want. You know, praise God. Oh, man, this is awesome. But if we're outside 
And he's outside of us. We're just in a coma state. In John 5, 41, I do not accept the praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name and you do not accept me, but if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God? You know, we must obtain the praise that comes from the only God. You know, a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. But having the love of God in our hearts needs to be the source of praise. You following me? Are you following this scripture? Having the love of God in our hearts needs to be the source of praise for this praise to be accepted. The human heart cannot praise God. It can only selfishly want to have their wants and evil desires fulfilled. And if that happens, their selfish, reactive, manipulative praises will flow. That's the human heart. That's what we were born with. God knows the heart and will not accept this deceptive praise. There must be a new resident in the heart for the praise to be accepted. Verse 41 again, let's read that again. I do not accept the praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another, yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God? This is tough. This is tough. You know, and I can, I can see myself in that hospital bed just going, no, praise God, this is so awesome. I just love this dream that I'm having, you know, and, 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 and the warmth and the comfort and stuff like that. And, and you know, and, and I'm having this dream and all these people are around me, you know, it's so good. And, and if I wake up, my old dream will be devastated. You know, I can end it or it will end for me. You know, we can't stay in the womb or we will be stillborn. We must be born again. You know, there, there's this abundant life waiting beyond the stupor of this reality. There, there's this, this love of God we must bring into our hearts that can't exist with this selfishness. As we process John from where the people first believed to the end of chapter 2, Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in a man. He knew what was in all men. He knows. Jesus then moves to being born again, pointing to his hanging on the cross as a serpent is lifted up in the wilderness, and that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, and, and I hope we just keep seeing these out, this outline as we go through John, because there is a progression. This is, this is cool, but there's a counterpart to all of this love, drawing information, and new birth. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil and they didn't want them to be exposed. And when we think of evil deeds that we want to hide with deception or hypocrisy or even hypercriticalness, it's not always murder. Man, I don't want to see people to know that I murdered someone. It isn't, it isn't always greed or, 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 or sexual immorality, you know, that, we, that they want to hide. It could just be being comfortable, living in our dream and saying, I don't want, I don't want to wake up. Our dream world of control as the angels, the scriptures, Jesus the Holy Spirit, God, and our, our brothers and sisters are beckoning us and sending out the alarm. Wake up! You know, we need to quit pushing the snooze button when the alarm is sounding, right? This, eventually, the, I, I, I figured it out when I was a kid that about nine times the snooze, then it quits. Right? This belief system is not a museum, a dream or a video that we watch, study, critique, or memorize. 
This is a reality we must be born into to accept, participate, be transformed, and be healed. In verse 45, it says, But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Let's turn to John 1.15. You know, this, this is crazy. That, that's why I love to go through the entire Bible. Read what Moses wrote. Read what David wrote. Read, because it, it just displays, it, it unveils Jesus. He says, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. But they speak of me. And throughout this, we look at God's justice. We look at God's loving kindness. We look at the failures of men. We look at the, the victories of men. We look at everything there is to look at, the whole grand scheme of things, and it points to Jesus. And the possibility, the huge possibility, the promise that if we come to Him in repentance, that He's going to dwell in us, and we will be reconciled with Him, that we can be one with Him, that we can be like Him and transform to His image. It unveils Jesus. It unveils our new life in Christ. In John 1, verse 15, it says, John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Oh, I, I, I read that verse 18, and, and this is, I don't know if I read it before, but wow, did you hear what it says? No one has ever seen God, but the God, the one and only, who is at the Father's right, but God, the one and only, it's talking about Jesus, is at the Father's right side. <laughs> yeah, it has to talk about Jesus, who's at the Father's right side, has made him known. Um, I looked it up in in, uh, in John, in, in, in the NASB, it says, no man has seen God at any time, but only the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So, and then King James Version, it says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Um, there's two sources of manuscripts in the Greek. One has the only son, the other the only God. You know, this is the image we were created to be in. In God's image we were created. You know, and, and sin has snuffed out that connection. But Christ redeemed it by becoming sin for us and nailing it to the cross. All scripture testifies to this. I wanted to share the Greek interlinear slide from John 1.1, 1, 1. you know, because, because of this, I, I have it. Yeah, there it is. I don't know if you guys can read this, but uh, this, is, this is what it looks like. There's the Greek words, uh, Eve, Logos. Uh, I can read some of them. Um, but if you read the bottom, it, it's, the, it's the Greek uh, translation. In a commencement, or in the beginning, I was the word something said is word and the word was with the god and god was the word and you know we talked a little bit about the um jehovah witnesses said that uh, they have a god in there but it is the it's a it's a it's a specific specific article in both, both time, or all three times the is used, it's a specific article uh, according to nominative, singular, masculine, uh, and then the is specific, the T. But uh, anyways, a little bit of Greek for you. The next verse, 18, John 1, 18, looking from uh, the next verse, John 1, 18, um, here, here's, here's how it reads in the Greek that, that the King James Version took it from. God, 
not even one by extension at any time, the only born God, a son, the being to the bosom, the father, a father, that one to consider out. And the notes are, there's, there's two. There's a Masoretic Greek text and the majority text. And uh, this was taken out of the majority text. And the Masoretic text was a different one. It's, it's, it's older. Um, it's got older manuscripts using it. But, but we, don't, we actually don't need it to say either. Both are true. Right? Both interpretations are true. Both Greek things are true. This is just... One of, the, one of the things that caught my mind, and I said, whoa, um, and I thought I'd just share it with you. But let's, let's turn to Luke 16, 15. Jesus is God. You know, this, and that's why I put John 1, 1 up there. Jesus is God. His miracles and the testimony and glory given to Jesus by the Father verify this. This isn't just a script. This whole truth entered this reality in the flesh to draw us, beckon us, to wake up, to live for the eternal. You know, we have a hope that reaches beyond this reality, the veil of this reality. We have a risen Lord to follow. In Luke 16, Jesus said to them, you are the ones, and he's talking to the Pharisees, who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. The law, the prophets, were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. And that's, that's, that's a purpose, to, to read this word, to read this word. We're going to go to uh, Luke 24, if, uh, starting with verse 25, so if you flip forward a few chapters and go to Luke 24, 25. This word and, and, and it, the least stroke of a pen, I'm, I'm, I think even the spaces are inspired by God. So Luke 24, 25. He said to them, how foolish you are. And he's talking to the two guys on the road to Emmaus. And they're, they're sitting there and saying, you know, this is such a sad day. Didn't you know what was going on? And, and Jesus is walking with them because they, and Jesus, they didn't recognize him. But Jesus had just been crucified. And they were so sad. He was buried in a tomb. And now Jesus was walking with them. They didn't see him. But, he, but this, is, this is them. He said to them, how foolish you are <laughs> and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Going to, to verse 44, this is when Jesus comes back and, he, and the disciples are all in this room. The doors are closed and then all of a sudden Jesus walks through the door, not even opening the door or he just appears in there. And uh, he, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses. The prophets and the Psalms, everything must. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. No genuine belief is depth. It is based on truth. It's based on experience. It's based on repentance. A simple, reactive belief will fail if it does not root itself in the good soil. So I'm challenging you guys. Read this. Understand this. But more than that, absorb it. Let it be a part of your life. Jesus, and, 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 and we we're looking at Jesus' life. This is the image we were created. Jesus says, Jesus, I had to suffer. That's part of the Christian life. And, uh, and, and you know, the Christian life is not and cannot be done without God. Even Jesus could do nothing without the Father. You know, and, and as we go through Scripture, take it in. Let it cover you, transform you. As the love of God, the Father, becomes sourced from within. 
so that our praise will be acceptable to God. Just as you are, we come broken to be mended. We come wounded to be healed. We come empty to be filled. And we come guilty to be pardoned. But he welcomes us with open arms, just as we are. Not so that we can stay here, but that we can wake up and become what God ordained us to be from the beginning. Let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you so much for all you've done. Lord, we thank you for, for your scripture, your word that, that, that leads us, the law that leads us to Christ, that, 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 that shows us that, that we're empty and that, that the praise from our lips, even though you know, we may think it's so sincere and reactive, that it's, that's not acceptable. Lord, we need you in our lives. We need your love. Lord, and, and even, you know, if we give everything we have to the poor or, or, or speak with, with words that are like angels or even give our body to be burned, it's nothing. It's not acceptable without love. And Lord, let this be the drive. Let this be the, the wake-up call that we all need. As we look around us, Lord, let us absorb you and the desires of your heart. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.